year, 2017, and uh, again, another uh, year where we can do our PDEC mining snap segment, and I'm very happy to have with me Joe Mazumdar of Exploration Insights. As you remember, last year we had him on the show with uh, Brent Cook, and we had a very interesting talk, and we looked at valuations, at looking at mining companies and how they're getting bought out or purchased. But this year, we had a very interesting presentation where Joe was talking about the junior mining market update and talking about exploration. So, uh, Joe, thanks for being on this uh, this morning. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So, uh, one of the interesting things you had about your talk was your investment focused. Uh, you talked that you're looking more upstream now on gold exploration companies. And as well, you know, you were you were also focused on base metals, but you're also looking at anything in the base metal space. So can you just go a little bit in that? Sure. I mean, in terms of the gold space, what we do, uh, you know, we can see is that if we're looking uh, into the, let's say, five to ten year window, in the, in the zero to five window, there's a lot of drop in capital expenditure so mm -hmm. that we don't see a lot of things coming on. And so a lot of people are forecasting declines in production. Right. And if the gold price stays where it is, the problem is that there's not a lot of quality projects to replace reserves. Mm -hmm. And reserves have been declining at these kind of price levels. And so if there's no grassroots exploration, we don't see how these quality projects are going to be found. Right. And so we're moving in terms of uh, investing in these companies in the junior mining life cycle into the... Um, uh, upstream with respect to exploration right. and lower market cap, so a high risk, high reward, lottery tickets uh, is basically what we're playing in the gold space. Mm -hmm. and, and moving to the zinc space then, you stand out as a very attractive segment as well. Um, and you, you mentioned very uh, something very interesting when you're in your slides, was talking and looking very specifically at uh, concentrate where it's refined and, and versus just the normal concentrate. Because at the end of the day, you mentioned a very good point where, you know, it all comes down to metallurgy at some point down the road. Right. So can you just talk about that? Well, yeah, like we talked about copper and zinc, uh, yeah. but specifically the graphic you're talking about is one where you could show a consistent refined imbalance in the zinc market. Right. Deficit, deficit, deficit. But the spike in the price just happened uh, last year mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm sure that the inventory started getting uh, to a point where it mattered that there was a significant deficit. Right. But it's in the refined balance. And so what we were looking at as well is it's a concentrate balance. And so most mines make a concentrate, a zinc concentrate that they sell to a smelter. They don't sell refined zinc cathode. There's not right. a lot of that. So a mine would sell to a smelter. So their product is not zinc cathode. It's actually a zinc concentrate. Yeah. And if you look at the zinc concentrate market, it actually goes down quite a bit in terms of the mm -hmm. imbalance. Uh, in the next year, such that what we're looking at is not only quality projects, but quality is defined by the quality of the concentrate that they produce. Right, exactly, yeah. And, and that's very important. So if they produce a sort of iffy concentrate, then we're probably less inclined to invest in that project than one that's got a high quality potential mm -hmm. concentrate. Okay, interesting. Uh, so let's go back and let's talk about the issue of depleting reserves, because you know, in your presentation you mentioned approximately around eight points. And, uh, you know, just uh, to give a statistic here on exploration budgets, for example, um, SNL did a part of their S&P Global Market Intelligence report. They, they actually studied that $6.9 billion is, is how uh, it's been in its lowest in 11 years in terms yeah. of exploration. It's just, uh, it's been just so damaging to the sector. So it's, it's in lowest in 11 years. It's very serious. What's in your opinion, the most significant uh, item that shows that we're at, you know, are we close to the, the, the low end of the exploration cycle in terms of planning? Well, okay, there's, there's exploration, is, is, is two sides to it. There's like a brownfields exploration and there's right. grassroots exploration. And what we've seen, like when, when exploration really spiked, it wasn't as if all that money is a proxy for intelligent exploration. So yeah. some of it was ineffective right. and badly done. A lot, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of people with experience actually conducting these programs. They were funded, mm -hmm. but not necessarily uh, uh, going to bear any fruits. Right, right. So now what we're seeing is most majors in the gold sector are doing much less grassroots exploration. So if they give you an exploration budget, most of their exploration budget is related to brownfields, and mm -hmm. brownfields only means finding something that's proximal to an active operation of your okay. own. So your hurdle rate is less, right. and you're trying to either add mine life to the project right. or expand it. Okay. But to go out into a grassroots exploration, you've got to build all the infrastructure, so it's got to really blow you away mm -hmm. for you to do it. Right, right. And they're not investing a lot of money in that, but what they're doing is taking private placements and doing uh, joint ventures with right. companies that are actually doing the grassroots exploration. Right, right. For the well, let's say not excluding last year, but the three years before that, none of these companies were being funded. 
right, the grassroots right. explorers, yeah. Yeah. and big companies weren't doing any grassroots yeah. exploration. Now we're suddenly seeing financing for the grassroots guys. But is it enough? You know, as you look at prior years, is it enough that the majors and majors are finally, you know, they finally got it? You know, we got to really go. Yeah, it's cyclical, full, full and uh, whenever they have problems with their uh, expenditures, GNA, they almost include exploration as part of their GNA. Mm -hmm. It's something that could be cut because they don't see the near term impact of it. Right. Even though many of their deposits may have been found by internal mm -hmm. organic exploration, mm -hmm. they still don't give it much credence. Right. Such so right. that if there's something to cut, that's what they'll cut. Right, right. And so bang for buck, it's better for them to spend their money on, on brown fields where they could see a, a, a return in the next three years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, whereas grassroots, you don't know if you're going to find anything. Right. Okay. Interesting. And then uh, let's move on to another another mo uh, another metal, and then we can finally get your outlook on what you're expecting this year going forward. Uh, one of the one of the items that you mentioned was looking at uranium. Right. And you mentioned a very interesting thing that a lot of the companies out there, based on uh, the prices now, it's just not possible to make money. And one of the things you mentioned was the difference in the long-term contracts and the spot contracts. Can you just explain that and so how, that, any, how that any, works? So any uranium producer has exposure to long-term contracts and spot. And because long-term contracts, they're long-term, they can be $50, $70 per pound because they were signed five years ago. Mm -hmm. And as these contracts don't get renewed, their exposure to spot, which is more like $22, $25 a pound, right. increases. Right. So even if the spot price goes up another 10, 15, 20%, the problem is they don't make money until it gets to 40. Right. So yeah. they need a certain amount of the long-term contract in terms of weighting their production. Mm -hmm. And as these long-term contracts go away, their exposure to spot increases, then they've got a bigger weight to the 25, and maybe $30 per pound, and right. much less of a weight to the 50 and 70, mm -hmm. such that their ability to generate free cash flow becomes becomes problematic. Right, right. You know, uh, because what we see right now is a market basically in balance, mm -hmm. with still an inventory overhang that's going to take a while to get through. And that's not just me talking, that's the producers like Amico saying that. Interesting. And, and how long do you think is that, that number of years that you mentioned? Well, until demand picks up, it could be protracted. Yeah. What they're all waiting for is China to turn around, but yeah. quietly China's building up its own stockpile. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, interesting. Okay, uh, well, then the last thing I wanted to mention was, uh, um, okay, so what's your outlook going forward then? Are, we, are the floodgates finally open where, we're, where the mining sector is, is fully back now? Or what, where are we at right now? Well, I mean, I, what I've heard some... is that there's like it's the money that was there before is coming back, but in terms of up to the end of... February, my numbers suggest that the amount of equity financings right now for the mining sector is actually a little bit less mm -hmm. uh, than last year, but we saw a lot larger financing, so a lot more money was going to fewer players. So you remember there was like 900 million U.S. financing that Franco did last year? Right, yeah. That's about, on Canadian terms, that's about the equivalent of everything we've seen yeah. up to the end of February, but that was one company. Wow. What we're seeing is a much more transaction at the five million dollar level, ten million dollar level, funding the smaller guys. Yeah, and that's why we're constantly seeing financing news because it's not just one company; mm -hmm. it's a bunch of companies. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is some of the companies that we follow um, have been offered bought deals mm -hmm. where they were never talked to for yeah. four years, yeah. and they've actually upsized those, doubled them, and got over allotted. Suddenly, some of these guys have expiration budgets and treasuries that mm. they, that wasn't even their market cap two years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. If you want to find out more information uh, with Joe and, and Brent, uh, you can visit explorationinsights.com uh, as they have a lot of free reports and articles and one of the main reports that they've done and continually, continually update is called the Fatal Flaw Report, which is something that's uh, very interesting. It's looking at companies and looking for that fatal flaw that really you know uh, uh, makes a decision to either invest or not. So check out the website and any last thoughts, Joe? Uh, no, I mean, uh, this is a high risk, uh, high reward in terms of grassroots. It's a bit of a lottery ticket, so, uh, you know, don't bet your mortgage payment on it. Okay, perfect. All right, well, thanks, guys, and we'll, we'll talk to you soon.